Greetings, Global Citizens. We're back for part two of my conversation with Chike Frankie Edozian. We are getting deeper into his story and discussing his memoir, The Lives of African Men. So please stay tuned and be sure to catch Afrolit Sons Frontier, which is going on now. And that is at, again, Afrolit Sans Frontier. You can find it on Facebook, you can find it on Instagram, and you can find it in the show notes. So sit back and listen and enjoy another episode of the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. I'm Florent to do, and here we go. So speaking of your travels around Ghana and experiencing the different um, ways of people, this is when I'd ask my guests to tell us about what they hear. So what I ask is for you to share a word, phrase, or saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value it as a local speaker. <laughs> well, I will say when I'm up north, a phrase I often hear, which is, I guess, some sort of a greeting. So I've heard it in the mornings, afternoons, mm-hmm. and things. Is my friends would say eduta, which I guess means like, I don't know, good morning or good afternoon in um Gonja. Gonja. Okay. And what is it? Eduta? Eduta, yeah. But it always makes me smile because I think about the hospitality with which it is being said. Oh, okay. And anytime I am in northern Ghana, I have this sense that, or this feeling of everyone is so hospitable to me. And I love it. I would agree. <laughs> and, and I always find ways to run back up there. Yeah. I mean... I've only been to the north once. I've been to Tamale and I guess a little bit north, like I've been to Bui, that area. So I was really proud of myself. At one point, I'd been to all the regions until they added regions. <laughs> I also like in, in Accra, people say Chale a lot, which okay. I, I guess it's a for friend and it's a good thing to be friendly. It's just like a catch-all. Yeah, it's like, a catch-all had, for everybody, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I've had so many. So, so many of my guests say, oh, I love Chale. And everyone has had a different definition for ah. what Chile means to them. Okay. So I get it. It's just like, it's this expression that is just very meaningful because of, I think, works. the emphasis. Right. Yeah, and it's also in the delivery of the person who is delivering it. It's, you know, in, Exactly. When it, when it comes towards me, it's always a friendly gesture. <laughs> You're right, exactly, exactly. Very well. So let's get a little bit deeper into your works and your work. So you're a journalist by first training and and also by, I guess, passion initially. So tell us a little bit more about how you went about the business, you know, the business of being a journalist and then also in terms of evolving into founding a magazine and moving that from what would be what have been a paper publication to a digital publication and then becoming an author of a book. Okay. I think that early on that I wanted to work in journalism, I wanted to work in stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I was sort of going through school, I thought I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. I did studied radio. I studied television. Mm-hmm. I interned in a big American TV network called ABC. And I did, that was sort of the career path for me, except after studying all of this technical stuff and imagining myself as a, as a broadcast reporter and I got into the workplace, I realized that I really wanted to work more with words. And you can't work with words in television because you write the scripts for it. But I also Mm -hmm. realized that a lot of the work that I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to um, not necessarily rely on so many other people to do it. And newspaper reporters are able to do that easier than television reporters because in television you you know you you're not only looking at the material that you're learning about or that you're reporting but you do need like someone to help you with 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 the camera someone to help you with the audio someone you know there's an editor that comes in to actually like mix the stuff all this before you've written a script you know so it's a lot more collaborative process mm-hmm. and, and and my young self wanted to just write and I then ended up trying to work in a newspaper and then I realized that even though I had studied broadcast journalism, I really wanted to be a person who told stories with words under my control. And Mm -hmm. that started a career of writing stories and writing about politics and writing about government in New York City. But early, it would have been in the later 90s, I think, I started to, as I got older, 
saw the impact of what daily journalism does and how we or how I was not representative of what I was seeing in magazines and newspapers. And very often, you know, we were put in this catch-all for black and nothing wrong with that, but I was looking for a little bit of nuance in some of our storytelling. And so I started this magazine with friends of mine called The African Magazine. And it was, it was a, a name that we picked because we're really looking at continental Africans in America or first-generation people, people who you know, were fully American, yes, or lived in America or lived in Europe, but had this very strong ties to either the country of their parents or where they were born or that it, they had not been removed so much. So they maybe spoke the language, maybe traveled a little bit and had relatives that were, you know, on the continent. So they also had this understanding of the immigrant experience, either because they'd gone through it or people in their family had gone through it. Sort of like that whole mixed family thing where somebody has papers and the other one is trying to get papers. And we wanted to tell the stories from that world and the accomplishments from that world. And so we called it very broadly the African magazine. And that was, I think, a commercial success it was not, but I think a mm. critical success it was because it was hard to sell to advertisers because they didn't understand that or they didn't believe that that market, which for them seemed super niche, could be something that would be, you know, profitable. So sort of like, but why do we have to advertise here? If we want to reach black women, we can advertise in essence or ebony you know and your kind of black woman is still a black woman so it was difficult to sell it commercially but critically when we did the stories i mean people bought all the issues you know mm -hmm. ones we never had extras lying around people subscribed to it in the early 2000s after 9 11 it was tougher for any new business any. Mm -hmm. So established mm -hmm. businesses were able to weather the storms, but people were shaken and scared and advertising revenues dipped. And it was hard for us to continue with the print product, even as we tried really, really hard to reduce the frequency. So we thought, mm -hmm. you know, instead of, I remember one time, you know, we we're like, okay, we're going to go from every month to uh, every other month. Should we do quarterly we do 10 issues and then, you know, I remember one time we were like, we do 10 issues and then November, December issue would be one big Christmas issue. It's not cost effective for us to put out an issue in June and July. So we'll just make one big summer issue, you know, and pack two or three months in there. But I, as much as we try to do things, it, the magazine resonated with the people that it was primarily for. Right. And I was right. very, very proud of the kinds of stories that we, we put on our cover and the people we chose to highlight. I mean, I think one year we had the late, great Wangari Matai had won the Nobel Prize for the Green Belt Movement. And the information had come to us quite late before we decided to print. Mm. But we still rushed to get a story done and to get images and all that. And I had made the decision that that issue... We weren't going to rip it apart. We were going to include Wangari Matai's story and this wonderful news about the Nobel that was coming in very late. And maybe we'll do something extensive. But we we're going to go with the cover uh, that I had originally planned, which was of a politician who was a rising star in the Democratic Party, who was the son of an African and an American. And people were like, when the issue came out, this guy is interesting, this guy is nice, but, you know, uh, Miss... When Gary should have been on the cover. And it was like, you know, I hear you, but as an editor, I'm thinking the story came in late. This is not a magazine for Hearst or Condé Nast where there was money to just say, rip it all off. And, you know, right. I mean, <laughs> that one print run and that was it. And ultimately, yeah. I was very proud that we didn't do that because the person we put on the cover ended up being the first black president of the United States. And we were one of the first people to tap into that. Why? Exactly. Because we understood we understood that black excellence come in all forms. And as Africans, mm -hmm. we could see a son of Africa doing great things. So mm -hmm. it worked out fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, obviously, we could not sustain a print product. And it was difficult to maintain fully an, an online product, which, you know, maybe several years later, we would have done it well online. But the thing about the African magazine was that as much as people liked the product, and as much work went into it, it was, by all of us who were doing it, a great labor of love. We used our own money to do it. 
So that meant that everybody was working on it after work. Yeah. We would go to work all day and then in the evening get together and assign stories, write them, edit them, and all of that. So it became really, really tough to keep pouring all your money into something that other people didn't believe in, but you knew was was a good product. And I always wished that we could have had a benefactor to help us for maybe another six months or a year. And we, we might have been able to had become the product that I had dreamed about, which was maybe not necessarily the biggest magazine in the world, but something that was self-sustaining. Sure. You know, something yeah. where, you know, that, you know, we didn't need like to sell, you know, a hundred thousand copies every month, but something that we could sell that people could get at home and we could have enough advertising for it. That was my dream at the time, but that didn't quite work out. But the other side of things, which is why I always tell young people and people are around me that there's really no experience is a waste. You know, right. Because you don't know who's watching. Uh, you don't know who's exactly. reading. No experiences mm-hmm. always. So we, we may have felt at, you know, at some point that, you know, we've put every single bit of our savings in it and, you know, we're still struggling and it's so hard. And, you know, if I hadn't put all this money, if I hadn't sunk all this money in, I may have had enough money for that down payment or that house or whatever it was. But I don't have any regrets because many, many people saw it. It made a difference in people's lives. And, you know, it got me opportunities because the product was a professional product. And I think people who read it that offered, asked me to do things as a result of that didn't quite realize that, you know, we were not sitting in a big office somewhere, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that this was something Mm -hmm. we were doing at home after work. You know, so Mm -hmm. it gave me a lot of very, very good experience with editing and decision making and all of that stuff. And as much as I I wish that it had been at least profitable for maybe even just one year Mm -hmm. or maybe even not profitable, but maybe if it had broken even for a year or two, that would have been great. But I think that even though that didn't happen, I'm very, very proud of the work that we did. Sometimes I look at the old covers and I'm like... We did that with no money. <laughs> right. You know, we right. highlighted African fashion designers, African photographers, mm-hmm. Afropean. They used to call them at the time the people that we were writing about in Europe who were doing incredibly amazing things. And we talked about them before most people even got to see them and to hear from them. And it was just a mm-hmm. wonderful platform that gave us a great deal, even if it didn't give us money. I think that's the challenge with so much Black media now. So, I mean, when you look at the landscape now, we still are struggling for this model that is based on advertising, that is based on what the mainstream has determined will sell. So, I mean, I'm myself in media here and it's basically grants or bust or my own pocket. So that's just something that we have to start to grapple with and start to look to our benefactor community to somehow impress upon them that if we're not telling our story, someone else is. That's the bottom line. And something always gets missing when somebody else tells you. Exactly. Exactly. The confusion becomes very deep. Yes. So writing a Mm -hmm. book and putting it out there. So you've written a memoir that I'm sure it spans so many different years and epochs in your life. So (laughs) I have to admit, I'm I'm typically um, a physical book person. And so since COVID and I said, I want to read this book, you are my first Kindle on my phone. Yeah, my first Kindle on my phone. My phone book, because I have a tablet in, you know, I would have used it on a tablet in the U.S., but I don't have it. But so I read the entire book on my phone. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> I'm very proud of you, too, because there's Thank no you. lot of Kindle here. And it's actually available in paper in Ghana, in Accra. Is it? Oh, well, that was, well, I start, we spoke yeah. during the early days of yes, lockdown. Yes, so of I said, okay, you know, just got to Kindle it and, and find it. So thank you for that. Now I Thank I you so much. Kindle. You know, Kindle's great. Yeah. So, so the book is... The Lives of Great Men, and it is a really interesting journey of you coming of age and coming, just coming forward as yourself in general. So tell us a little bit more about how how you came to get the book in your mind and then on paper and then out into the world. I had not intended to write a memoir. Mm. My training is as a journalist, so I'm always, in my mind, the least interesting story. I had no desire or interest to write about myself because I just don't think I'm that interesting. (laughs) I just don't. I participated in doing an anthology of creative nonfiction for Mm. something called, it uh, it was a Commonwealth-funded project 
the book was called Safe House. And there was I think, a couple of Ghanaian writers, a couple of Nigerian writers, it was everywhere. The editor of that book, Safe House, is an African author based in the UK named Ella Wakatama Ofri. And I'd done this, this piece for her. You know, we had talked and uh, I just, you know, did a little piece about myself and growing up and first loves and all of that for that project. But my mind was set to do a book about all of these interesting and great people that I had come across in my life. Why did I want to do a book about them? Because there was a moment here in in our part of the world where the anti-gay stuff was just every day. I mean, I remember being here in Ghana one summer, maybe it was 2012. 12, maybe. And every day, I'm still a newspaper person and I read physical newspapers. And I had a stack of newspapers that I had bought every day for the almost three weeks running. Every day on the graphic, there was a gay story. And it was so anti. And I was just like, what happened? Because I was here last summer. Nobody gave a shit about, you know, who was going to which club and who was dancing with who in Jamestown, and there's always been gay people here, and who's doing so? Nobody seemed to care. What happened, like, between one summer to the next, in which every day, you know, it was fire and brimstone on the newspapers? It was so bad, I actually, like, spread the, the newspapers on the floor of the apartment I was renting, and I took a picture of it one week. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I was like, lesbian, this, gay, this. And, and I just thought to myself, oh, what am I missing here? I went to the graphic, and I interviewed the editor at the time, and I said, you know, this is really like some homophobic shit. What's going on? It's like, no, 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 we're not homophobic at all. I mean, we use homo on the front page because every time we do one of these stories, people buy them. For them, it was a business thing. And I was like, but, but you know, you and I were in, the, in this profession. You haven't had any, not even pro, but just somewhat neutral stories that don't demonize gay people. It's like, no, we did. Yeah, we had a front page. Really. <laughs> called his assistant, bring me the da, da da And it was like a front page indeed of maybe a bishop or somebody saying something like, well, you know, these people are not criminals. You don't have to like them. Something like that. Very simple stuff. And they put that on the front page on a Saturday. Their least. <laughs> their least <laughs> the, the lowest. The lowest. Yeah. The lowest circulation, circulation. paper. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so I ended up writing a, a, a story about that for Color Lines magazine. Color Lines is an organization that's based in the U.S., Mm. And they they have a magazine where they have stories from all over the world. And I just wrote about how I spent this summer in Ghana and I had just seen the effects of American evangelism seeping down to preachers um, like it had happened in Uganda and telling people that basically the reason you're having trouble and all the economic woes you have is because there are these gay people who are coming to like take the little that you have and just whipped up this frenzy. And I, so as I was writing that story, and I was like, and here's the example, because I was here last year and this year, look at the newspapers, look at stuff that was just not even, you know, there, I remember there was a gay night at this club, you know, Sue, where you could go on a Wednesday night, I think, and they would tell you, oh, you know, it's, it's a gay people night if you wanted to go, if you didn't like it, you know, not happening anymore, because everyone, there was this culture of fear that permeated Accra. You know, there are these places you could go to, Labadi Beach for reggae at a particular night, there'd be like, you know, queer couples in the corner. Nobody cared. There was this club that you used to go to in the Accra Mall where it's happening every weekend. Crowds, dance and everything. And there was a little corner where it was always the queer corner and nobody seemed to give a shit. All of a sudden, all of that was just over. And so I wrote this story thinking, well, the least I can do as a journalist is to tell stories. And, you know, and I wrote that one story and sort of felt a little bit unfulfilled with it mm. because the story came and, you know, a lot of people read it, but then it didn't really change anything. And this continued to be right. worse. And so what I decided to do was that I was going to, you know, all these people that I knew, I was going to get them on the record. I was just going to collect stories. And at the time, I didn't quite know what I was going to do with it. I thought, well, I've written a story for a magazine and maybe I could do a companion or a look forward after that through as a documentary, you know? And so I would interview these people. I would tape them. I'd get them on camera. And it was a bit difficult that the next summer, because many of these people were not people who are publicly out there. Mm. So many people didn't want their faces shown, but they were happy to talk to me because I'd known them, known their experiences. As I was getting them on the record and just not quite knowing what to do with this material, but I was going to do something with it. 
And obviously these kinds of things take months, you know, and I was collecting the stories and collecting the stories. In Nigeria, where I'm from, the president at the time was facing re-election and his polls were in the dumps. And so he did a bunch of desperate things. One, he postponed the election a few months to try and get more traction. I remember. The other thing he did was to sign the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, which was the most draconian thing we had seen from an African government about same-sex couples. Outside of what Uganda tried to do with the Kill the Gays bill, this was just completely horrible. Automatically just mandated that anybody who wasn't heterosexual in Nigeria is a criminal, just in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. And any organizations that, you know, try to work with them or do anything were not allowed. And, of course, I saw that as a desperate bid for re-election, but he still lost the election and somebody else won. But what happened was that it unleashed this wave of reprisal attacks on gay people. If somebody didn't like a person or suspected them to be gay, they now felt emboldened. They could attack them. They could beat them. They could call the police. You know, if, if you had a dispute with someone like a friend of mine did over a parking spot, they could call the police and take your dispute from being a parking dispute to your existence as a gay person. Should you be allowed to leave? Or, you know, there was a lot of humiliation. There were, you know, in small towns, raiding clubs where women were gathering and parading them out and saying they had busted lesbian covens. You know, they would attack young men who were partying and line them up and say they were all gay. I mean, some of them probably were gay, some were not, but it, it became right. a thing where the police could instead of fighting crime, we're now fighting LGBTQ people. Mm. That was one thing. It now emboldened criminals to be able to rob people who they perceived as weak or who they perceived to be gay, knowing fully well that you could not go and report to the police because the police would then turn the argument over, well, you know, you should be in jail for 14 years. There was a lot of awful things that happened in Nigeria as a result of that. And when that happened and that started to happen, at that point in time, I was like, I really have to write it as a book because a lot of the media coverage of that time said things like, you know, 99% of Nigerians are in support. 99% of Nigerians are not in support of anything, anywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're just not in lockstep like that, you know, even right. for LGBTQ stuff, you know, and I was like, yeah. which, which poll are you looking at? I mean, these are the people who have children and, and they have lived with their LGBTQ families and find ways. They don't have to necessarily like, openly endorse them, but, you know, but you, you just cannot create criminals out of families, mm -hmm. you know? And then I started looking at people that I knew who were expected to take the helm and run major corporations and things in Nigeria, in Ghana, and in, in Zambia, Zimbabwe, everywhere where I knew LGBTQ people. And many of them had just said, fuck it. You know, all these people are trying to recruit us to go and live in these big countries with big salaries. Why do I have to deal with this shit? Because of love of country. I mean, you know, so I had this situation where I was seeing this brain drain that I could point the finger at to, you know, anti-LGBT behavior and people just taking off. And then I also had this situation where I was seeing like people who'd never had a passport before, people who'd never been to college, people who you can't say these are people who have gone abroad and been westernized, you know, choosing to get married and also have affairs with their true loves on the side. You know, so you had these men or these women who they had to get married because that's what's expected to them and procreate, but they were having these relationships because it was the only way they could have any semblance of, you know, joy in their lives. And I just thought, right. you know, this is awful. <laughs> this is awful. I remember asking, you know, a particular couple that was very in love with each other and, you know, I'd interviewed them separately and together and separately. I remember asking them, well, you're married. You know, who can you live without? Who do you love more? You know, your spouse or your boyfriend? And it always came back to the boyfriend. But they have to be married because we're in Ghana here. You know, we're in Ghana here. <laughs> and they would say that phrase to me. And I was like, what does that mean we're in Ghana here? I was to explain. And so the, this and this and this. And they would tell me of the consequences. And I just looked mm -hmm. at, like, all these people, you know, saying shit in newspapers and on television. And they have no idea the damage they're doing to their citizenry. Because one trope that was always easy to throw around is that these gay people or these gay activists, they're those who have gone and corrupted themselves abroad. You always see them, they went to school abroad and they think they know everything, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, this guy's a driver. This guy's a tailor. This guy doesn't even have an ID card. <laughs> you know, he's right. a farmer in Abri. You know, right. his interaction with the West is television, maybe if he has DSTV. 
And, yeah. you know, he has a wife and he has a boyfriend somewhere. So how do you explain that? If you're now saying it's only those people who are college educated that have gone abroad and blah, 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 blah. And yeah. so I am not an activist, but what I do is try to bring context and tell stories properly. Mm-hmm. And so I said to myself, let me try and just bring some of these voices that have been completely absent in this debate, completely absent in the news coverage. Let me try and give them an opportunity to be heard. And then I started writing lives of great men about these people, you know, these Mm -hmm. LGBTQ people around the continent in different countries facing the same kinds of issues whose voices are almost never heard. Because I wanted that there should never be an occasion where there's a reporter who's doing a story and they say, well, the poll says 99% of the people support it and they have no evidence that there are other people because they can't find anyone to quote. So they would say, Mm -hmm. well, you know, there's one or two activists, but that's all we know. And in working the story, I remember my friend has edited me several times, Ella Alfrey, you know, just sort of understanding that my story was important, you know, and other people who were helping me, you know, and one time my agent just said, put more of yourself in it. The late Binya Vanga Wainaina, who was a friend of mine while he was alive, I guess still is in heaven. You know, he told me, Frankie, kill the journalist, kill him. For this book, you know, remove this whole objectivity shit and write about yourself as you write about this man, you know, Mm -hmm. and just, you know, treat this work with the reverence and all the reporting that you will do, but kill the journalist in you that says you're not part of the story, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's how this book went from being a straight nonfiction book about people to being a memoir, a mix of my life and reportage. And Mm -hmm. I am very grateful for how it came out because I think the result, while it was not what I envisioned in the beginning, it's the best book I could have produced about this issue. It needed yeah. something, not just these lives. It needed me to bring my own experience to it. And as a journalist, you generally try not to do that because you want people to judge the work mm-hmm. on its own merits, not what you think. Because I, mm-hmm. you know, as a, as a journalist, I always say, who gives a fuck what I think? Let the people make up their mind. Give them the evidence. Give them the right. research. Let them make up their mind. I shouldn't be, who the fuck am I to start telling my reader what to think? You know, and that is my mindset when I write journalistic stories. But for this project, Vinia Vanga was right. Ella was right. My agent was right. I needed to give these lives a little bit more context in their interaction mm-hmm. with me and talk about my feelings. And what I know about doing a memoir is that memoirs can be unsatisfying if you don't give the truth. So I didn't write this book and sort of like gloss over my own failings. I talk about them as openly as I can. I think there are mm-hmm. things in my life that I've done that were wonderful, but there's mistakes that I've had. There's messy relationships that I've had. And I just <laughs> put it all in there. Whatever, yeah. You know, so I think that for me, the book that ultimately came out, while different from what I envisioned, was the best thing that I could have, was the best treatment of these lives that I could have done. Because it's less academic, it's less removed, because there's my feelings and my own life interspersed with all these stories. Yeah, I saw your your story to be a lot of a joiner. Like you joined all the stories and you weaved it with your travels. And so I thought that that was definitely very valuable in telling the story. And it's interesting because we connected in April. I was in London in March. Oh, okay. You, you made it back before we got shut down. Yes, exactly. And while I was there, I went to see a play. It was called The High Table. And it was about a Nigerian couple in mm-hmm. London. Mm-hmm. It was uh, two women. Mm-hmm. And it was calling, the, the subtext was the calling of the ancestors to approve the wedding oh. of these two women. And what it showed was that, you know, the ancestors, you know, on one side you had, they were, they were waiting for the last ancestor to join. So, you know, the discussion was, oh, we're not going to, it's going to be too much trouble for, for this one. Why are we going to approve this? It'll just be trouble for her. There's no reason. Just let it, don't approve it. And then the last ancestor to join was the most recent ancestor, which was her uncle, who had committed suicide because he was being harassed because he got caught in a club in Nigeria and he wasn't able to escape. And so his life was basically over. And so it just really showed. And then when he came to the group, he initially was not going to approve it because of that pain. But the reason they all came together is because the eldest ancestor was herself a lesbian and she had died 
for that struggle to be in a couple. So it just really goes back to show that none of this is coming from outside. This is just the nature of humanity. We just choose who we love and that's basically how it works. So I definitely appreciated your story and the, and the story of the lives. And I think that while you're not an activist, you are an activator. So yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's a great way to look at it because, you know, I, the, the only thing I know, I don't know a lot of stuff and I've never tried to be a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. you know, so the only thing that I've really, really done the bulk of my career is journalism. Even teaching mm-hmm. is new for me in terms of that it's been 10 years plus 12 years that I've been teaching professionally, but my mm-hmm. main career has always been journalism. And so I'm not one who knows how to organize protest or you know, how to lobby governments or how to lobby people. I don't know that, but I know how to like see stories that people miss and how to put them Mm -hmm. together. And so what I wanted to do was like, this is my way of showing that anybody who is a researcher or journalist who is looking at our lives cannot say what the prevailing narrative is, is that we're so few, we're a minuscule minority, you know, we've never been there and it's only those who have been to the West. So that was sort of like the the goal with with the work. And I think I sort of like achieved that. Now, the other part of it, which is the publishing business, it's really, really difficult for people to look at your work and envision what you see and think that because the book business is a business and Mm -hmm. think that that they should take a chance and publish that, not because the quality of your work isn't any good, but would anybody buy it, which is you know, it's a reality. It's like, I've been in the magazine business. I've been in the news business. I know that you have to do things to get a commercial success. Right. Otherwise it's, you know, so I'm particularly proud of all of the publishers that took a chance on this book Mm -hmm. when it was just the manuscript and, you know, people not only liked it, but decided that they were going to publish it, you know? So I'm very proud of my publishers because many, many, many publishers, many did not see it as a viable commercial success. Sure. You sure. Know, many people told me no one would buy this. Many other people told me, you should probably go and make it an academic book so it sits in a library somewhere <laughs> versus mm-hmm. a commercial book that you want for wide distribution. If you make it an academic book, then, you know, scholars will see it. And, you know, and I didn't do that because I just thought, no, I'm writing for my people and my people don't need to spend $100 on an academic book. Right. I think yeah. They need to have yeah. a book that if they want, they can access it and it's not going to break the bank. And so I had an agent who really, really believed in my work, you know, and mm-hmm. she believed in my story and she believed in my writing. And she just kept telling me, I don't like to tell writers the no's when they come in, but just know that everybody who has rejected this manuscript, it's not for them. And we will find right. you the right place. And ultimately, mm-hmm. it was very, very gratifying for me because when a, you know, it's it's like a publisher takes a chance on a, on, a, on a work, and you know, it's a business for them. They have to make some money, or at least mm-hmm. have some hits to buffer, you know, mm-hmm. the work that is artistic, and they needed to get out there for the culture, and maybe that might make a little money or not so much money. But it was really mm-hmm. gratifying for me that they. They did that, especially when the books started getting shortlisted for things. Even before it mm-hmm. won the Lambda, it was shortlisted for a bunch of things. And that made me very, very proud. Because as you know, you know, it's not about awards. But if you are right. shortlisted for anything, that gets eyeballs on your book. Yes. You know, you're shortlisted for this, you're shortlisted for that. That allows bookstores to take a look, allows bookstores yeah. to buy it, allows websites to talk about it and put it out there. And if mm-hmm. you want your book to get, you know, especially, you know, you're writing a gay book about Africans, you know, you and African bookstores don't want to carry it. But if it's now getting recognized as a critically good piece of work, you know, mm-hmm. that allows them some cover to say, well, you know, it was shortlisted for this or it won that. So, and there's all of these calculations that go into things, but I've been very, very grateful for the support of everybody around West Africa and South Africa and East Africa who looked for the book, who tried to buy it, who asked people to bring it for them before I had distribution. Everyone who's invited me for their book clubs, whether it be virtual or in person. I mean, Nigeria is supposed to be this great, big, you know, homophobic place, but I have had invitations to book clubs. People have read the book and engaged with it and loved it. And I've never once felt like, I shouldn't be selling my book over there. In South Africa, it's a place I spend a lot of time. And, you know, it, the book has been out there since 2018. And I keep getting people who are reacting so viscerally to it because, 
they just see themselves in it. And that's the thing about literature. And that's why I keep talking about this current canon of literature that we have. People have a different reaction when they can finally see themselves. They can recognize their lives in the books and in the piece of literature that they are reading. And a lot of mm-hmm. time, what is told to us is good literature, which we buy and we read from outside, is good maybe in terms of craft, but it doesn't give you that joy when you don't see yourself reflected in it. And I really, really understand that at a very deep level, because many people who have either written to me or stopped me at the airport or said, I want to send you a DM about Lives of Great Men. The one thing that they have said was that I enjoy this book so much because I finally saw myself in it. And it's not just LGBTQ people, you know, it's heterosexual Africans who are recognizing their brothers and sisters, people Mm -hmm. in their lives that, you know, they had not seen fully. And they're looking and saying, but this is, this is us, you know? And Mm -hmm. so I, I'm very touched and very humbled and very moved by it. But I also know that that is the more reason why we should all campaign for better books. We should all campaign for giving our own writers the ability to tell our own stories, not just LGBTQ stuff, all of our stories. Because we are finally realizing that we, there is no one who's going to tell our stories for us. We have to do it. We have to write our own books about ourselves. And when we start to recognize ourselves in all the books that we read, it is just joy. Yeah, it's transformational. And so that leads me to my next question, which is my mindset hack. So this is where I ask my guests to tell me your favorite or an innovative mindset hack. So it's one that you know of or one that you can imagine. Oh, my God. What is a mindset hack? (laughs) (laughs) So it's basically a way of thinking or doing that is a bit different. It flips the script a little bit. So it's, you know, just you hack in and, and change make changes or innovate in ways that are transformational? Hmm. Well, I don't know if it's a mindset hack for me, but I think of late I have made a conscious decision to only have people in my world and around me in places that I can control who don't have negative energy. I wasn't able to do that before because I'm a person who likes to see the good in everyone. And sometimes you have to work with people or you need them for this or that, or you're just being nice. And in the last couple of years, I've just decided that if there is someone who has toxic energy, I don't have to be that polite to keep them around. I just sort of excise them like a boil and I keep it moving. There you go. That's a great mindset. I had to do that with some people who, you know, have always been in my world. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. I think this relationship has expired. There you go. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what I mean. That's a mindset hack because if you tolerate things that are negative, then you can't be free. Yeah. It just festers. And, you know, people have bad attitude or like, you know, like for instance, I don't, you know, I just don't feel like it is my role or my job to teach people at this stage to be good people. You can be bad and nasty if you want. I just don't have to be around you. I don't have to explain transphobia or homophobia or ethnic bigotry. I have to explain all that to you. If you don't know, you don't know. And I just won't stand for it in my orbit, you know? Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. do you. And if it works for you, that's fine. But, you know, I don't have to have, uh, you know, a white supremacist as a friend and say, this is one of the good ones. I don't have to have, you know, a cousin who's a transphobe and say, well, it's my cousin. I I just don't know. (laughs) Uh, You go and educate yourself. And when you are... You know, when you have education and you you understand your bigotry and you're able to check yourself, we can have a conversation. But prior to that, I just don't feel it's my job in this day and age with all the information that's out there to tolerate prejudice and bigotry because, you know, it's always been that way. Or maybe this person's your boss or maybe this person's this or that. I just, Mm -hmm. life's too short. (laughs) Absolutely. So speaking of short, I've kept you for quite a while. So I just have one last kind of let's get into the mind and the life of of Frankie before we sign off. And that is, um, what are you listening to these days? Ah, there's a song. It's called Jerusalem. Oh, I think I have heard that song. I'm sure you have heard it. Everybody has heard it. They don't know what it's called. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I think I have. Okay, so we're going to add that. Yeah. Listeners, you're going to have some really great show notes this this week for this um, episode. Because 
we've spoken about so many great books and so many great resources for, for knowledge. And then we have this song that we'll be featuring. And if you don't know Burna Boy, you should get to know him yeah, because it's pretty interesting. He really is an artist that you should get to know. Also, there's a thing that, you know, I don't know when this is going to air, but there's a thing that I've been been a part of this lockdown since it started. It's called Afro Lit Song Frontiers. And what it is, uh, it's been a virtual uh, a literary festival of African writers, fiction, mm-hmm. nonfiction, short stories, poetry. And when we mm-hmm. have, um, when we do it, it's usually two episodes in a day at noon mm-hmm. and at 6 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. And it's whatever it is in your area. And mm-hmm. we are going to have the fifth season. So we've been doing this now. We've done it for five weeks, bringing oh, wow. African artists and African writers from all over the place to okay. interact directly with us. I mean, it's sort of like the first of its kind African literary festival that's completely virtual. And it's been quite wonderful. And many, many people have had access to writers that they may not have had before. So the fifth season begins on July 27th, and I think it goes to August 3rd or August 5th. And okay. during that week, at noon and at 6 p.m., you will have a writer talking about their work for the hour. There will be readings, mm-hmm. there will be poetry, there will be discussions. It's all really fire, and it's, it's amazing. And if there's an opportunity that this comes out before then, if you could just mention and tell people to go to Afro Lit Song Frontiers on Instagram. It's all very democratic sure. and they can just join us and just not just celebrate literature, but just enjoy what, what we have to offer. Sure, sure. I think I think we can do that. Thank we you can, very, we can get very some, much. get some ears and some eyes on the, on the festival. I love it. I would appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, Frankie, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and Thank your you. thoughts and your art and your craft. Do you have any other last words before we sign yes, off? Yes, if you haven't read Lives of Great Men, you can find it wherever you get your books okay. <laughs> it's on kindle if you're in the state yep. it's on amazon if you're in england it's on amazon as well but it's also in the places like bookshop.org uh, gaze the word in london independent bookstores if you're in west africa like we are it's available through a wonderful company in nigeria called Weeda books that has flooded uh, west african market rated here in ghana it's available at video books it's also available at bookstore.net i believe it's called and the okay. Ghana Writers Project also has that. And if you're in Southern Africa, a wonderful company called Jakarta Media has it in bookstores everywhere. So join the train, read Lives of Great Men, and, you know, call me and let's talk about it. Okay. <laughs> and, and you, of course, will have all kinds of connections in the show notes. Again. Thank you so much for joining Thank you us. so much for having me. And I appreciate yeah. everything and the time and just yeah. the conversation. I'm very grateful and I thank you for the time. And, you know, in a couple of weeks when we do Afro Leaps on Frontier Season 5, please join us. It's a barrel of laughs. I will, definitely. I'm always looking for new content. So, you know, a lot of us are spending so much time in. Yes. Let's just... That's why we do it, because people are trapped at home or trapped behind your desk. And for an hour each day, we can bring you a little relief, a little thought story, nonfiction, poetry, whatever. We got it. So I'm excited. I'm excited. All right, Global Citizens, thanks again for joining us for another episode of the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. You can always reach us at www.localcitizenspod.com on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Podbean, anywhere that you get your podcast, you can find this podcast. So until next time, bye for now.